it's possible, very possible, to imagine a monolithic or Unitarian God who would, certain, would, would have certain divine attributes, certain things we could say about God. We can imagine such a God, this monolithic, unitary God, be, as being, living, and knowing, for example. In fact, these were the very same attributes or characteristics that the Greek philosophers gave to spiritual or divine realities. Such a god, though, if you'll pardon the expression, has no arms, however. He may be able to condescend, maybe, in some sense, and I mean that in the sense of stooping down, not patronizing necessarily, but you know, the one who reaches down to help those who need him. So he might be able to condescend in some sense, but he won't be able to step down or open up or bring us to share in his life, his inner life. Without a wisdom shared and a spirit sent forth, what connection would we have with such a God? What kind of life would there be in such a God? Above all, how could we truly say that such a God is love? Now, um, many preachers, hopefully not this one, <laughs> behave in a weird way on Trinity Sunday. Maybe this is the only day I'm normal. The rest of the time I'm weird. But many preachers behave in a weird way on Trinity Sunday. They become uh, self-deprecating. They become apologetic. They might tell us that Trinity Sunday is some kind of you know, epilogue, a uh, postlude to the Easter season, an odd feast in honor of a dogma, a strange teaching we are, of course, obliged to accept while being just as obliged not to think too much about it because it's a mystery. They often end up speaking about the Blessed Trinity as if it were just a more complex Unitarian God, basically the same kind of thing as a God of Judaism or Islam, but with a much more interesting private life. Or uh, they turn God into a committee that is in perfect agreement about everything, kind of like the, the old Supreme Soviet in the old Soviet Union, for example you know, the, the rubber stamp assembly, so to speak. But to say that something is a mystery does not mean, quote, well, there's no point thinking about it. It means, rather, that there's no end to thinking about it. We can certainly say that the Blessed Trinity, what, what we can certainly say what the Blessed Trinity doesn't mean, even if we can't say what it does mean. If we paid attention over the last eight weeks to the gradual unfolding of the meaning of Easter in the liturgies of the church, then we have already seen the mystery revealed in the death and glorification of Jesus Christ. We have seen that the Trinity, it's not a postscript, it's not an appendix to the mystery of Christ's life, death and resurrection. But it's the heart of it, you see. What Jesus came to show us. The love God is laid bare for us to contemplate. The Paschal mystery, uh, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and ascension, is not just about Jesus, a, a noble and worthy prophet, as some might say. It's about him as son of the Father, it's about him returning to the Father who had already glorified him before the world was made, and from that place sending from the Father the Spirit of truth. The Spirit is sent to abide, to dwell in the disciples forever, you and I, to lead them, to lead us into all truth, to bind them, to bind us into the unity which is the love uniting Father and Son. 
The spirit of truth will guide you to all truth, we hear. Thomas Aquinas, close to us Dominicans who are here today, um, is daring in how he interprets this. If we are to think correctly, rightly, about creation and salvation, he says, we have to know the Trinity. So the fullness of truth into which the Spirit leads the disciples is the truth not just about God, but about everything, because everything is included in creation and salvation. Uh, there was a great Danish philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard, he's also a religious thinker, he put it very well. He said, for him, the truth is Christ. It's impossible to know the truth without knowing Christ. Those who persevere in the search for truth will discover that it is Christ. And in finding Christ, we find not only Christ, we find the Father and we find the Spirit. Consider for a moment, consider this image for the Trinity. Okay, I'm about to lay on you, so to speak. Picture, imagine a father and his little baby daughter, recently born, okay, and that relationship that's growing between them. The father, you know, says to his daughter over and over again the word love, love. The child, of course, at that stage would have no understanding of what her father was saying to her, but as the word passed between them, the reality it signifies was being established and strengthened between them. Our brother Thomas Aquinas, in his own great image, describes the Son as the word that breathes love. Here is the blessed Trinity. The Father speaks a word that breathes love. Physically, of course, there can't be any word. There can be no word without breath, without life and energy. Intellectually or, or spiritually, a sound is only a word when it has not just life and energy, but meaning and sense. And so the Father utters his word carried on the breath of the Spirit and we are embraced by that word and spirit, coming to dwell among us, abiding with us, dwelling in us, the arms of God wrapped around us and taking us into God's heart. This is our happy situation. A word spoken between God and ourselves establishes and strengthens the reality it signifies, the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, we may not understand, and I don't pretend to be any different, we may not understand very much of this mystery hidden before the ages, but it means, St. Paul says, that we have been given access to this grace in which we now stand. We can rejoice in the hope of sharing the glory of God. The Father has spoken a word that breathes love, and that word has found its way to our heart, its life and energy, and to our lips, its meaning and significance. Back to that father and his baby girl. The father, the human father, speaking love to his daughter um, will be delighted at any babbling that comes back in reply. Saint Gregory the Great says, the great pope, says that all our talking about God is a kind of babbling. All preaching, sometimes, more than others, I'm afraid to say, but all preaching, all theology, all prayer, too, as he says in, 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 in a very 
invocative Latin, he says, all this is but a balbutiendo, balbutiendo, an infant's meaningless gurgling. St. Thomas uses that very same word to talk about the human quest for truth, not to despise it for its humble achievement, but to encourage it to stretch and to grow. Because God is a trinity of divine persons, God is truly tender love, and so a source of delight. The first reading speaks of this delight with the word or, or wisdom of God, you could say, playing happily, creation unfolding as a wonderful adventure, a dramatic game. Gregory the Great says that creation echoes what the Father said in uttering his word, and so creation, that includes you and me, creation is word-shaped and teaches us much about him. There are creatures, including ourselves, who not only echo the wisdom of God, but are capable of responding to it. Not only hearing, but understanding. Not only understanding, but being able to, to respond, to talk back, even if it's mostly babbling. For all the poverty of our words and the poverty of the love that they express, we have a great hope because God hasn't remained isolated in his splendid mystery. He's invited us in and made us to resemble it. And so God's love has been poured and is being poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. When we say then, God is love, and also say, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are simply stating two ways of saying the very same thing. And now, enough of my babbling for a bit.